Hi, I'm Anna Hoffman, and welcome to this episode of Data Exposed Live. We have a packed show today, uh, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about the Azure SQL news update. So if you're familiar with Data Exposed in the show, every month we bring on all the most important people to talk about what's new in Azure SQL and other related topics. Um, I also want to say that there's a blog post that's associated with this show that goes live at the same time as we do. Uh, so if you head over to aka.ms slash news update, you can get all the latest news, including uh, information about all the different speakers that came on and links to learn more. So with that being said, uh, the final thing I have before we get into our updates is if you have any questions, you can head over to aka.ms slash learn TV or wherever you're streaming from, whether it's Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, uh, anywhere else, Learn TV, or you're joining through the Microsoft Reactor, uh, we're happy to have you. And we are looking at your questions wherever they come in through. Uh, so feel free to put them wherever you are. Say hi. Let us know what's going on, what you think of the updates. Um, we are here to kind of engage you. So we'd love to hear any questions or feedback that you have. All right, let's get right into some product updates. We have a lot of updates this month, actually. Uh, not all of them come through in what you might see as product updates, but you'll see them through some of the other blog posts that we have. So the first, <clears throat> excuse me, the first couple updates I want to talk about are about things that are generally available in Azure SQL Managed Instance and Azure SQL Database. Now, the first one I wanted to talk about is for Azure SQL Managed Instance. So in early September, we announced a change in the instance delete flow. Uh, so what this means without getting too much into the details is that Azure SQL Managed Instance contains a set of components hosted in what's referred to as a virtual cluster. Now, with the new announcement, we're helping by automatically deleting that virtual cluster once the last managed instance in the cluster is deleted. So we'll actually automatically go in and remove that as opposed to keeping it around for a certain amount of time like we used to. Uh, so that's just one thing to check out, be aware of. Uh, I think all in all, it's a good thing and something that doesn't really require you to do anything. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention for Azure SQL Managed Instance and also for Azure SQL Database is that uh, we now have you know, create uh, capabilities through the Azure Resource Terraform Registry. So they've introduced new language uh, called Azure RM SQL Managed Database or Managed Instance. Uh, before, what you have to do had to do if you were using uh, Terraform is actually go through the ARM template, and this was kind of a workaround, but now it's kind of more native. So hopefully that helps you with your your development, especially if you're using Terraform today. Now, for Azure SQL Database, there are a few things uh, that became available recently. Uh, one was SQL Data Sync for Private Link. Now, this is something Mara Stu, the program manager that owns this, has been on the show to talk about before. And she's also done some Data Exposed episodes. So if you want to learn more about that, I'll link to it in the blog. But you can also check it out on our YouTube page. Uh, but basically, this is just going to allow you to use SQL Data Sync while you're using Private Link for Azure SQL database. So you can create a secure connection between the sync service and the hub and member databases. So lots of cool stuff so far, more stuff coming. Uh, and the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, new server roles for Azure SQL database. And this is something like I'm always learning about. And uh, Andreas, who we're going to bring on in a second, is always posting blogs about security so I can learn and stay up to date. And we'll share some of those later. But without further ado, I want to uh, go ahead and bring up Andreas, uh, PM on the Azure SQL team. Andreas, thanks for joining us today. Hey, Anna. Thank you very much. And I gladly noticed that you made me first. This is a good sign. Customers <laughs> should always keep in mind security should be the first of your concerns when you implement a new system. So maybe it's nice to keep this logical order here. All right. Yeah. So what am I bringing here? Um, we have three new server roles. Um, I'm going to show, show the details about them in a second in a small demo. But what has been the challenge uh, and why we made them or created them for Azure SQL Database? Um, let's talk about that briefly. So in Azure SQL Database, uh, you may be aware that we don't really have the concept of a server, not a physical server, not an instance, like we have managed instance or IAS deployments. Uh, we more have a, like a logical concept of a server and databases do not necessarily reside on the same physical instance as other databases. So that creates a bit of a challenge. And today, because of that, or until today, we did not have any um, 
roles that uh, that have permissions across many databases at once, like you would have it in managed instance. But now we do, so we have implemented uh, server roles. Uh, we had to trick a little bit uh, behind the scenes, but we got the behavior very close to what you know from IAS or managed instance server roles. So the idea is really that the server role contains permissions and they can be inherited down to any user database. Um, if I'm showing here in the next uh, small animation, so it re really requires you to have a login, obviously. The login can be member of a server role. And then depending on in which database the login has a user account, there he will have the permission inherited. So what kind of permissions are we bringing here? The idea is really to support customers to enforce the principle of least privilege better than it's possible today. Um, today you require, for many scenarios, like for, for monitoring um, across an instance, across uh, many databases, and also there are specific uh, tables that only exist in master, you wouldn't require the AAD or server admin account. So we are bringing one of these roles, the server state reader, uh, which will have access to all of these uh, DMVs and catalog views that you require for performance monitoring across all databases, including the logical master, if you have a user account in that database. So we are addressing, addressing mainly four typical scenarios, performance monitoring, security auditing, like static, who has, who has which permissions where. Um, also for the database documentation, you can use the definition reader, it's the first role or some server configuration task with which the server state manager can um, uh, accomplish. All right, let's see it's a little bit more concrete an example. So imagine you have a user account, Jiao. Um, you want her to be a member or sorry, to, to do performance monitoring across the, um, the whole logical server, except one database, DB5, for whatever reason. So you would have to create her obviously as a, as a login, assign her membership in this server state reader account, and then in every database, uh, create a matching user account to that login, um, except DB5. So she can't, or this person can't access DB5 and that's it. So that's one way. Uh, by default, you can't access a database, hence you won't have permissions there. Um, if you want to make absolutely sure that nobody else accidentally assigns access later and then she, uh, this person would have the performance um, state reader, the server state reader permissions there, you could also even uh, create an explicit account in DB5, but then uh, assign an explicit deny connect to this uh, user account in that database. So there's basically two ways to ensure a certain database ex is excluded, either simply don't include it or specifically assign a deny in T-SQL. So let's see that in, in real T-SQL. So on this system here, um, this C Azure SQL database, I have three databases uh, if I count the logical master, which is always there. Um, and I have I've queried here the system. I'm querying server role members and SQL logins. So here I can see who is member of which server role. This is the new one, MS Server State Reader. We have Server State Reader is an account that I created. Uh, There's an artificial name here. Uh, that's me and Jiao. All right. So these are the accounts matching to the uh, server roles. As you also notice, these server roles have this new, um, or not really so new, but the prefix uh, dash, um, double cross twice and ms underscore to make sure they don't collide with other potential names that may exist. So th these exist now. How, how did I create them? It's pretty simple. You create logins, right, whatever hard password, and then you use the author server role statement that's the server role name and add member. And here comes whichever login you created uh, ahead and then you would uh, execute the statement. So that's how I did it here. I added these, um, uh, so the members here to the server roles one time in master database. And now I just need to go to every data uh, user database where I want them to have the permission inheritance and create a user from that login. So that's how it works. So if I want them to have access to AWO and master, I go to those two databases and create a user based on the login. The permissions from the server role will be inherited. 
So, is that really true? Let's see in a different script. Right now, I'm connected as definition reader. We can see this also here in the user token. I am definition reader. And I can see my permissions uh, from the server. So these are the permissions that the definition reader role contains. And he, it's inherited down to the current database. Currently, he's connected to database AWO. And we have a few other um, metadata functions here that show which permissions does he really have, has perms by name, et cetera. So you can uh, tell that he is really a member of definition reader. So we have seen the server level permissions. What database level permissions does he have the, the definition reader? Um, he has security definition, view definition. Those are the typical ones. The, yeah, I think I did the <laughs> kill database connection myself. That is definitely not part of the role officially. Otherwise, it would have been inherited from the server level. Right? Everything that comes from server will be inherited downwards. So he can query, or this person can query, for example, sys tables, all tables that exist in the metadata. Um, he can audit basically what do we have here or who has which permissions. Scenarios like that can be accomplished with that. He cannot query um, contents of tables. So it's really a metadata reader role. Let me reconnect as the server state reader. Sure, am I really server state reader? Yes, I am. So we see the permissions from the server. I'm right now on master actually. We see I have view server state. I also see, and now I'm gonna point out a little bit here, we have two more permissions, view server security state and two view server performance state. They are actually um, subsets of view server state. They are new permissions. We haven't documented that yet. So we see some news around them in the future. All right, so just pointing out, if you get to the server state manager, you will also find uh, documented that we lowered the permission requirements for a bunch of DBCC statements. So you, you can also run those without having to revert to server admin account. All right, that's it. Thank you, Anna. Awesome. Cool. Thanks so much, Andres. Uh, one question we got from Learn TV, uh, just if you could answer it quickly, is can these new roles be assigned to AAD groups? Um, we don't have AAD logins yet, so we can't assign it to AAD groups. Um, once we have AAD logins for Azure SQL database, they, you can't assign them. You can assign them AAD users, but I know that AAD groups will be a little bit different challenge, so it will likely take another cycle to include them. Yeah. Awesome. So it seems like coming soon, but coming eventually, but not right now. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome, cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Andreas. This was really useful, and we'll link to your blog and some of your other blogs uh, in the news update blog. So thanks again. All right, okay, one guest down, and we have uh, quite a few more to go. So let's keep rolling. Uh, one of the other exciting announcements was Scalar UDF inlining, and I'm going to bring Pooja up to tell us a little more about it. But just a reminder, this is something that came with SQL Server 2019. Um, and now is available in Azure SQL Platform as a Service. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Pooja. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on the show, Pooja. Hi, Anna. Thanks so much for having me. A big yeah. fan of the Data Expo show, so <laughs> it's great to be here. Awesome. It feels great to have you on the show. Um, you know, I'm just going to pass it to you to tell us a little bit about it and maybe even do a demo. Awesome. So like we just mentioned, uh, this is a feature that was part of the 2019 Vox product. So a couple of our customers have definitely used it. It's part of a feature family called the Intelligent Query Processing. So basically what these features do is they improve the workload performance with minimal implementation uh, effort to adopt. What we mean by this is that with something like T-SQL Scalar UDF inlining, all that a customer has to do to be able to use it is to ensure that their compatibility level of the database is 150 uh, and ensure that you know your Scalar UDF is meeting a broad set of requirements. So there's no other changes required. It's as simple as that. So uh, I just wanted to do a quick recap, Anna, for some of our uh, Azure customers who have not used this before. And this is a tale of two engineers that I'd like to uh, you know, bring up while we talk about what this feature is. 
And uh, this is a true scenario, by the way, that uh, Karthik Ra Dr. Karthik Ramachandra uh, encountered while he was working in the Microsoft Research Org. And this was a problem statement that led him to go into the research project called Freud. And eventually that became a feature called Scalar UDF Inlining that's part of uh, SQL Server today. And it's now available in Azure SQL DB and Managed Instance both. So it's a story about two engineers. And uh, you know, let's talk about a successful e-commerce company. And you, you see two data sets on the screen, a customer data set and the order data set in millions and billions of orders. So it's a one to many you know, relationship. Um, and we have a manager who's trying to uh, bring in a rewards program, a simple rewards program to categorize customers into, you know, say, platinum for customers who exceed 10 lakh orders, uh, gold for those between 5 lakhs and 10 lakhs, and the rest are regular customers. So we have two engineers, new engineers on the team, and both of them are vying for a, a promotion. And uh, now let's see. Uh, you have to tell me now who gets promoted. I'm going to tell you what each of the approaches were. Right, so the first engineer, she's a SQL expert, so she goes ahead and writes a query that you see on the screen. So it's a query that gets the job done, and uh, 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 and to someone who's not an SQL expert, this is something that may be slightly complex to understand. The next engineer that we have is a programmer, and uh, based on you know programming best practices, she goes ahead and creates a UDF for a user-defined function, as you can see on the screen. So uh, this engineer thinks about all the best practices, and as we know, uh, uh, anything that a user-defined function is something that encourages you know modularity or code reuse you can use this function in different parts of the code that require this it's easy to maintain any kind of changes that need to be made can be done in one place rather than uh, you know go about and change it everywhere uh, which would be the case in the sql query so uh, as we also know some tasks are better to express and read as well so the engineer too is very pleased with herself and uh, now comes the moment of truth. Uh, both of these are handed over to the business and uh, we're looking for which is the best solution and who gets promoted. So Anna, what do you think? Oh man, I don't I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wanna say that like the master is getting promoted, but I don't know. <laughs> All right, so I'll put you out of the misery. So the promotion goes to the engineer one, the SQL, SQL expert, and because uh, it, took only two minutes to run on this data set and the programmer's uh, function took a few hours even though it is the best practices of programming that she was following and this is a scenario that we said uh, led to the uh, creation of this particular uh, UDF inlining uh, feature so a very quick overview before we get into our demo about why traditionally UDFs have performed poorly in SQL Server so what you see on the screen is your function there. And uh, uh, when we're talking about a query optimizer, it treats UDFs as black boxes. So it doesn't know how to cost them correctly. Uh, this lack of costing that we see is the cause for bad plan choices. So scalar operators are not costed uh, properly. They are thought of as inexpensive, whereas in scenarios, uh, they may be pretty expensive. And this results in bad, bad plan choices, right? So um, I'll show you later how we do not see that costing in the uh, uh, in the query plan. Another thing that we see is that when we have a complex UDF with select and where clauses, it leads to something called uh, row by agonizing row execution, which means it is invoked once per qualifying tuple. So for each customer, you're going to be calling that. So you can imagine how expensive that is going to be. So uh another few things are about uh it's not going to be easy it's not trivial to create parallelism for uh, a scalar udf and there are no cross statement optimizations that are carried out so i'm going to quickly show you a demo here uh do you see my screen yeah. yes okay great so what i'm going to do is create a function uh, a very simple function as you can see it's just going to return the five left characters of the last name. And it's a scalar UDF because it returns a single return value. And I've gone ahead and created this. I'm on a managed instance here. And I'm now going to go ahead and uh, just execute a query that references it. And I'm just going to include the actual execution plan. 
And let's go ahead and see how long it takes. So we're doing this right now without Scalar UDF inlining enabled. All right. So I see it took about seven seconds here. And if I look at my execution plan, uh, one thing that I'd want to see is look at my execution XML here. And I can see something here that shows me the UDF CPU time and the UDF elapsed time. And uh, going back to my uh, query here, if I hover on this and let me know if you can see it. Um, can you remember the estimated subtree cost for me that shows a 10.4 and a degree of parallelism shows me a zero. So now I'm going to go ahead and enable my T-SQL scalar UDF inlining. And like I said before, all you need to do is enable the compatibility level to be 150, or you also have a, a scope configuration uh, that you can turn on. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm just going to use a cold cache now uh, because I want to run the same query. And let me go ahead and show my actual execution plan is on. And uh, this is a very small data set, but uh, on a very big data set, you will be able to see the difference clearly. And this ran in two seconds. And if I go ahead and the same number of rows, and if I go ahead and look at the execution plan, uh, you will notice that we are seeing parallelism here. And uh, if I go ahead and zoom in here, I can see the estimated subtree cost is a 4.3. I can see that uh, the second line shows us that it contains an inline scalar T-SQL UDF, which says true, and the degree of parallelism is 8, which means uh, what it is doing is that the in scalar UDF inlining is actually converting the UDF part to a scalar subquery, and it's treating it as a regular SQL query, which can be then optimized by your optimizer. So a quick look here to see, uh, and I can see that I will not be able to see the scalar UDF uh, uh, in, in the query plan. So I'm only going to be seeing the CPU and uh, not exactly the, I, I will not be able to see the UDF there. And a quick look to see if you want to see whether your UDF is inlineable, you will be able to see this uh, is inlineable here. And this is my function. And if it says one, that means it is going to be inlineable. So all you have to do is set your compatibility level to uh, 150 and be able to take uh, benefits of scalar UDF inlining. So that's that's all I had. Awesome, thanks so much. That was really cool and really engaging. I, I just wanna note that we got a lot of engagement on Twitch and on YouTube. Uh, some people wondering about engineers getting promotions. You know, I just wanna say to all the engineers out there not getting promotions, go get your promotion. Um, and then uh, we had uh, some folks like our dear friend Simon betting on SQL engineer one for the SQL expert. Uh, we also had someone else voting for one. Uh, and uh, apparently we're also hiring. So go look at careers.microsoft.com. Oh, this this was very funny, uh, very <laughs> enjoyable. I do want to call out that everything you're talking about is available in Azure SQL Platform as a Service. Uh, so that hopefully that clears it up. Hey, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a really useful refresher for me for seeing Scalar UDF inlining again. Um, and it's awesome to see this land in Platform as a Service. Great. Thank you, Anna. It was great to be here. Awesome. All right. Moving right along. By the way, I'm just loving the engagement. So keep it coming. You can get featured on our channel, um, but uh, we got to keep it light. It's a Wednesday morning or evening, depending where you are. Okay. So there's one more update I wanted to talk about, and that's the things that are coming into preview uh, for Azure SQL Platform as a Service. Uh, we've added new functionality around differential backup frequency. Uh, we used to do this between every 12 to 24 hours, but we didn't tell you which one and you couldn't configure it. But now we've announced in preview that you can change this. Uh, the default is now going to be every 12 hours, but you can change it to uh, 24 if you like. There are various reasons why you might want to do this. Uh, we're not going to get into that here, but I will link in my blog to the details on how to figure out how to do that. Um, at the very beginning of September, we had um, Mohammed come on and tell us about this new Azure SQL migration extension in Azure Data Studio. I just wanted to remind you all that that went in preview this past month. Um, and we actually have a special thing we're gonna share related to this later in the show. Um, now, not exactly, I said there were some updates that weren't exactly like the standard updates that come from the Azure Updates website, but we have some really exciting tooling updates 
for both uh, DMA and SSMA. So feel super lucky. We're going to bring on uh, software engineer Nitu and program manager Alexandra to tell us more about these capabilities. Uh, so with that, let me bring up uh, Nitu. Hey, Nitu, how are you? Hi, Anna. Thank you for the intro. Uh, definitely, these tools are very helpful uh, in the migration journey. Awesome. Great. Well, I'll just let you get right into it. I know I think you had something you were going to show us. Yeah, so just want to make sure, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, cool. So yeah, with DMA 5.5, we have invested more into our SKU recommendation feature. But before going into detail, like what's new, I want to spend some time and show how we can use the SKU recommendation inside DMA. So for that, and now the SKU recommendation is available through command line only. And we are we have like plans for VI UI, but not in short term. Uh, to run SKU recommendation, you go to the installer folder where the data migration assistant is installed, and then look for a SQL assessment console folder. And then there we have this SQL assessment exe, which supports uh, four features right now. And out of these four features, two are related to assessment. And assessment is an important feature which tells user whether their SQL or their database is a fit for Azure or not, what are the features that need some improvement. And once that assessment is done, then the big question comes, which offering in Azure is a fit for me? Uh, in that case, we have the SKU recommendation capability, which is further divided into two parts. We need to collect some perf data to better uh, recommend which SKU is eligible. For that, we have this feature called perf data collection, where we collect data like CPU, memory at instance level and at database level, and IOPS or the files, database files. And then using that data, we provide a SKU recommendation. And when I say SKU recommendation, we aggregate all the data which we have collected during perf collection and then come up with, a, with the best offering that is effective and fits well to the workload needs of uh, of the user. Uh, so we have like good help here. You can uh, very well say, help, give me some help about what, how to use uh, SKU recommendation or give me help about how to use perf collection. Then these are some of the parameters which you can configure, either use them directly on the console app here, or uh, like me, you can have a, a config file, which we can reuse uh, for later purpose. So for this demo, I have this uh, config file set up where my output folder is in C drive. You can very well change it to uh, the one you like. And to run this SKU recommendation, you just have to call the exe and the parameter config file, and then just click enter. So at this point of time, we are trying to collect some data. So while it's doing, uh, it's collecting data in the background, I want to show you like how this collected data looks like. I have, it's for me, it, I saved it in a CSV format and this is what it looks like. That's the server name. If you don't see a database name, that means these are the server level data. And if you see a database name here, then these are the uh, database level uh, counters and for the details you can go to our uh, document where our uh, alexandra have provided like details of what these counter names are and how to use them so i let it run here and in another window uh, i'll i'll show you how to use that collected data to get a recommendation so for that again i have created a config file uh, this is how my config file looks like uh, i'm using the same output Put folder, you can change it. For, for this run, I want to get a recommendation for Azure SQL database. And these are my scaling factors, which I can modify uh, based on my need. So let me run this really quickly to show you. So at this point of time, we're doing some aggregation uh, on the data collected. And this is how the recommendation is. And in the previous tools, previous versions as well. So 
But with this new release, we have added a more user-friendly report where you can see all this, this offering in, in the report, which is saved to the output folder. And this is how it looks like. It's more friendly uh, as compared to uh, dumping text on command line. So, uh, and there's options like you can expand, you can go at the database level. Uh, this is a copy of my report, which I shaped, uh, saved uh, from the previous run. Uh, okay, going, going back to like what's new with this release, we have added uh, another option. Uh, we can choose like how many databases I want for my recommendation. You can uh, give that. This was not available in previous version. And another one, the important one is uh, we are uh, offering a, a elastic strategy for the SKU recommendation. And by by that, I mean it's like a pending patent, uh, patent by Microsoft uh, technology, which we are using uh, behind for SKU recommendation. Uh, Awesome. Cool, Nitu. This is this is really cool. It's great to see all of this kind of play out. Um, I know if you just wanted to go quickly through like what all the new things are, um, I have your slides up. Thank you, Emma. Uh, yeah, so as I said, uh, the uh, first one here is this enhanced user experience. You can uh, get this uh, HTML report and it's saved to the output folder. Uh, it gives like a clear picture. What what are the my sizing needs? What what are my storage needs? And if you click on those view uh, labels, you will see the justification and uh, with the proper requirements. And uh, the next one is uh, the feature to exclude or include uh, databases. This has been asked. Uh, for a long time. The reason being, say, if I have 100 databases on my instance and I just want to run recommendation for two of them, then uh, it's a little bit tough uh, uh, to to like uh, I to look into the recommended values and then go to the database. So with this feature, you can run SKU recommendation for n number of databases you want. And then the last one is the uh, new option for SKU recommendation. That is our elastic strategy. And as I said, it's uh, patent pending. And you can use that feature by uh, using this elastic strategy true option in the config file. And this is available only for uh, Azure SQL database and management sense, and not yet available for SQL VM target. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nidu. This was really cool to see all the different updates uh, that have been coming through and also see them in a demo. I know we're going to put some links in the show notes for people to go dive deeper on this and, and get hands on. But thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And I was a little nervous. My first data exposed with you. <laughs> hey, you've done great. And we're happy to have you back anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. OK, so moving right along with our updates, the next big update we have related to kind of migration tooling uh, is SSMA. So I'm going to pass to Alexandra. Uh, hi, Alexandra. You are no stranger to the show. Hi, Anna. Happy to be here. And a big hi to all our SSMA friends. Um, we have a new release. 8.22 is out. And we brought a new revamp reporting experience. You have amazing charts. Uh, we built that for all flavors of SSMA. It comes with 822, but it's also available in all the above versions that we are going to launch. And of course, is user friendly with all the famous browsers that we have on the market. Um, let's have a deeper look at actually of the things that we've built. Awesome. So we started with, uh, I think this is quite familiar for you. That's the old experience. So I started with the before so I can wow and impress you with the what's new. We had kind of like a basic table with a lot of useful information, but not really easy to consolidate and sort of conclude at the end of the day. So we still had that experience for you if you are looking to, to have like a warning errors or like really object level details. But the new thing that I want to talk about today are the charts. 
So we have two main charts that you can see on my screen. First one is focused on the object automation percentage. So I can clearly, I can clearly see that I have a very high automation rate. It's 86.7. That's on the Christmas wish list for our customers who are looking to migrate from Oracle. And also we have here uh, on the right side, a manual conversion time. So that makes it really easier for, um, for people who are using the tool to spot what are the easy objects to automatically convert and what are the things that would need to be a little bit of investment in terms of warnings or in terms of errors. Errors are things that you can um, actually manually convert. You would need to manually convert. So that's pretty nice experience. The charts are drilled through so you can get to the objects. And we also have a su subset of ch children here, the tables and the views. So you can have a look at the automation on each and every object level. Another new thing that we brought into the product is the ability to select between all objects and current object. So if you want to look just like at the current schema, you can do that. Or if you want, you can look at all the objects within the database. And we didn't stop here. So we also had a look at um, the left side. So this is the navigation tree. We added here really like some time regarding the actual conversion and the manual hour that you need to invest in remediating this project. That makes it really easy for you to spot the areas that you'd need to invest and the areas that you may want to postpone or you may not want to address during this migration. So have a look at these charts. Uh, give it a try with the latest release of SSMA. We also did some improvements on the time format function for DB2. So happy to hear your feedback. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alexandra. It's always nice to see some of the new things you're working on. Uh, we did just get a few quick questions. The question uh, was, does it migrate the stored procedures as well and the function? So maybe you can comment on that briefly. Yes, yes, yes. And thank you for your question. That's a yes and yes. So definitely we can migrate store procedures, we can migrate functions. So as an image is more than words, I'm going to show you side by side PLSQL and convert it to SQL. So you have a very nice source and target. Uh, we do convert select statement, insert, update, merge. Uh, we have also a nice improvement. If you have something that we can't automatically convert in your code, we are going to highlight that here on the bar. So all developers are out there are going to love it. And errors are going to be for things that we can't automatically convert. So we are just going to comment out that piece of the code. And warnings are going to be for objects that we can convert. We did convert, but you would need to have a look. Just make sure that the precision is still there or you are happy with the result of the conversion. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alexandra. And hopefully that answers uh, a bunch of viewers' questions. Um, as always, great to have you on the show. I'm sure we'll be seeing you again soon. Great to be here. Awesome. All right. Wow. We've seen so many announcements so far. So far, and We still have so many more. So it's an exciting show. We are moving to blogs and videos. Uh, there's a lot of episodes. Of course, we release episodes every Thursday. Uh, these are meant to be shorter form episodes. You can see Alexandra is a regular uh, herself and a good portion of the team is doing a series on migrating to SQL. Uh, so if you want to see deep dives into the two tools you just saw, DMA and SSMA, definitely go check that out. Uh, we've done some other exciting episodes this month, including talking about Citus, which is an open source extension uh, for making Postgres uh, distributed. Uh, so that's something you might want to check out. Denzel's episodes are always really heavy on the demo side. So he's talking about query store hints, which is available in Azure SQL database in preview and how you can use that to improve performance. Uh, just to highlight a few, we also did some great live shows. Uh, one I did with Silvano on IoT and Azure SQL database. You'll hear more about that from me in a little bit. Uh, but you know, just follow along. We do a lot on Data Expose. And we're trying to make all this information available to you as, as best we can. So we love your, your support and your feedback. All right, so moving on to the blogs, always I start with the Azure blog. And basically, I go through all the blogs and figure out what's going to be relevant to data people. So one thing I wanted to call out is these two blogs. Uh, one by Matt, Mike Flasco, the GM of Azure Purview, and one by Rohan Kumar, the CVP of Azure Purview. Uh, Azure Purview just went GA just last week, I believe. They had a big event about it. Um, and we're doing a lot to kind of integrate Azure Purview and Azure SQL 
services so that you can kind of govern all your databases. So this is definitely something to look into. I also wanted to highlight a few other blogs that are kind of tangential to the data space. Uh, one is Microsoft was named a leader in the 2021 Gartner Magic Quadrant for data integration tools. Um, so this is essentially a third party study and they kind of analyze the industry. And Microsoft stacks pretty well as a leader in basically every quadrant I've ever seen it in. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But uh, this is a, a new one that I hadn't seen before for data integration. Um, Mark Racinovich or Mark R is doing a series on advancing reliability. Uh, this specific blog goes into a resilient cloud supply chain. So if this is something that is interesting to you or your organization, just wanted to call that out. Uh, the, the final thing here is that last month, a coalition of leading European organizations announced the Eclipse Data Space Connector, or the EDC, which is essentially a European open source project, which is going to enable multi-cloud and hybrid uh, poly ba policy based business to business data sharing. So really interesting stuff that they're doing here. Um, I want to follow it pretty closely. And so I thought you all might be interested as well. Okay, I know I'm zooming, but we got a lot of updates. Uh, SQL Server tech community, really, really busy this past month. Uh, I just wanted to call out a few of the big highlights, but of course there's a lot in here. Um, so CU13 for SQL Server 2019 includes new functionality, which facilitates peer-to-peer -peer replication with conflict detection and resolution using last writer win strategy. So this is going to enable a lot of scenarios for multi-write configurations, which may have not been possible or practical before. Definitely want to read that one. Uh, then uh, the GA of the AD Util tool, uh, which is basically a way to ease your AD authentication configuration for SQL running on Linux or containers, uh, became generally available. And there's also a blog later on, the second, third from the bottom, uh, that walks you through a tutorial of how to set this up for SQL containers on Azure Kubernetes using AD Util. So that's something to check out. Uh, we're always updating the Microsoft Data SQL client packages. Um, the one I wanted to highlight was from 4.0 Preview 2. So this is going to be the latest and greatest package. Uh, the main announcements in here is that the configurable retry logic safety switch has been removed. So this is going to be on by default, and it's hopefully going to help you set the app context uh, and take advantage of this built-in configurable retry logic. Um, and the other thing is that SQL file stream is now supported uh, starting here, targeting .NET Standard 2.0. So something you may or may not be interested in and may or may not want to dive deeper into. Uh, Pedro Lopes released a blog about the last service pack for SQL Server 2016. Um, and this contains new functional fixes and enhancements. Uh, one big one that I noted was the ability to create an availability group listener without the load balancer to reduce the AG failover latency. Uh, so that was one big update. And the other one is supportability enhancements. Uh, including new X events, improved statistics and corruption detection, and a scalable uh, system health session. So a lot of stuff to look into, a lot of stuff to say up to date. I'm here giving you the news. Um, when we look at the uh, latest drivers for PHP, uh, a few things of note here is that it's going to support the latest version of PHP. But the other noticeable thing I notice is that support for Apple M1 ARM64 devices, which is pretty cool, and also support for table valued parameters. So those are two things uh, you might want to use uh, with PHP, so something to check out. Uh, just uh, one more is this SQL IOS sim. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Honestly, I should have asked before we, <laughs> we went live. But uh, this is essentially uh, used to perform stress tests on disk subsystems to simulate SQL Server uh, uh, activity. Um, and you can now use this for Linux. So something that uh, I think performance people uh, would be very interested to see, especially if you're using SQL Server on Linux. All right, you guys still with me, hopefully. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Microsoft SQL Server blog. Yes, the SQL Server team has two blogs, one on tech community and one on something called cloud blogs. There were three big blogs I wanted to mention. Uh, first, uh, Rohan Kumar, our CVP of Azure Data, announced the Past Data Community Summit 
So you're going to want to get involved, get registered. We've got lots of sessions, lots of pre-cons. Uh, it's also free. So there's no reason to not join us and learn about the latest updates. Um, then we also had a blog by Julie uh, talking about the new log analytics um, support in Azure Data Studio. So essentially there's a new Azure Monitor Logs extension. So go get this extension. It's really cool. I don't have a lot of time to talk about all the details related to it, uh, but I definitely think you all should check it out. Um, the final thing is that we're open sourcing the .NET 5 c -sharp language extension for SQL Server. Really awesome blog, really cool to see this open source. So go check that out. Um, now we're going to switch gears and take a break from the blogs and talk uh, to a, a guest, Daniel Norman from Prisma. And he's going to tell us all about Prisma, how it relates to Azure SQL, and how we can get started. Um, hi, Daniel. Hey, Anna. It's nice to be here. It's great to have you here. And you know, I know we're getting tight on time, so I'm just going to pass it right to you. Right. Oh, okay. So today I just want to talk about Prisma and Azure SQL. And I think as we've seen by all of the previous presentations that we had today, that relational databases, especially Azure SQL and SQL Server, have really come a long way in recent years in ensuring that your application data is really safely stored, uh, even as your application scales. Um, and sort of coming from the Node.js ecosystem, one of the main challenges in the Node.js ecosystem, uh, while it's become increasingly popular for building database-backed applications, it doesn't really provide uh, modern tooling for application developers to deal with common challenges when working with uh, databases. And uh, I think the sort of the two great examples of this is how do you ensure, for example, that your application code that is interacting with the database aligns with the database schema? Or how do you even verify the correctness of your database queries in your application code? And so this is sort of where Prisma comes in. And Prisma is a next generation open source ORM, and it supports Azure SQL, SQL Server. These were just released to general availability um, about a month ago, we also support Postgres, MySQL, and SQLite. And essentially, it helps you as an app developer uh, build faster and make fewer errors with type safe database access. And we're going to take a look at that in a moment. Um, so, they're really the two goals of Prisma to boost productivity by letting you query data in natural and familiar ways um, and increase your confidence with type safety and auto completion and, and a really robust query API. And so there are three main tools uh, that Prisma consists of. There's Prisma Client, which is a type safe and auto-generated client. Uh, Prisma Migrate, which is sort of a declarative data modeling and database migrations tool. And finally, Prisma Studio, which is a modern UI to edit and view your data. And there are three really important sort of concepts that are baked into Prisma. The first one is the Prisma Schema, which is a declarative single source of truth for uh, where you define your data model and it can be written by hand um, or populated by introspecting an existing database. The second is type safety. And type safety is really just a way to ensure that all of your application code interacting with the database can only do so safely. So, for example, attempting to query a non-existent column immediately raises a type error. Um, again, this is relying heavily on TypeScript. So, all of this is achieved by uh, generating a uh, Prisma client, which is essentially TypeScript uh, code. Uh, and finally, we have code generation. And the idea here is that you should, as an application developer, you should really only need to write things once. And what Prisma does is it, it saves you time by auto generating two main artifacts that you would otherwise have to write by hand. And those are the fully typed TypeScript database client, that is Prisma client and the SQL migrations, which are generated for you based on changes in your Prisma schema. So let's take a look at what that all looks like. So at the heart of Prisma is this Prisma schema. And in the Prisma schema, each model maps to a database table. And it is a human readable single source of truth for your database schema and application models. Um, and here we define ID as the primary key with auto increment and uh, email has a unique constraint and name is obviously an optional one. And sort of when we use Prisma Migrate, once you define this Prisma schema, uh, we get this sort of um, SQL that is generated for us. Now, obviously, we're working with relational databases. And so the core idea there is you want to be able to define relations. And so here I have an example where I'm defining two models, 
same user model and an additional post model. And uh, the relation between them is really denoted by this author ID foreign key on the post model. You may also notice these posts and author field um, and these are just sort of relation fields. So these aren't created in the database. They're really only used by Prisma client in order to be able to fetch um, and access those relations. Um, and so again, um, you know, once we've had the, uh, the Prisma schema and we've added the second model, then essentially a single command will generate this SQL migration that will define the second table and the foreign key between the two. And, uh, it is, of course, I should say at this point that it's also these SQL migrations are fully customizable. And so, okay, I spoke a lot about the concepts and, and the components, but like it's really sort of best emphasized when you see what it looks like in practice. And so I spoke about auto completion and you can already see here sort of the rich auto completion that I get. You're going to see now that I get this type error because I'm using, uh, I'm passing an integer to uh, a field that is of type string. Um, one thing that is sort of different about Prisma in comparison to many other ORMs, um, is that Prisma really avoids all of these complex model classes in Prisma. Essentially you get all of these model methods, which return really fully typed plain old JavaScript object. Um, and of course I should say at this point that one of the easiest ways, if you want to sort of try out Prisma, you can go to prisma.io and, and check out the quick start, but we also recently launched the Prisma data platform and the Prisma pl data platform, it really allows you to create a new project in under a minute. Um, you can provision, uh, or connect it to an existing database. And it provides a lot of the functionality and the foundation for a sort of what we view as this Prisma data platform as, as a way to sort of democratize data access for development teams, but we're starting small. And so here I have this um, example of a Prisma schema that is slightly more complex than what we started off with in the presentation. So we have this user model here and the post model. And of course, um, each one of these posts can have multiple comments. So there's a one to many relation between posts and comments. And additionally, a many to many relation between posts and tags. And you can already see how simple it is to define this many to many relation. Um, behind the scenes, of course, Prisma will create a relation table. Um, and so, okay, that was great. And we also have this data browser, which is essentially a hosted version of Prisma studio. Uh, and so here I can sort of look and, um, I can explore the data that I have. I can look at the, the users. I can also add users. Um, and of course, all of this would be, um, great if we can sort of create, uh, something using this query console. So of course we can use the data browser or we can use this query console, um, to sort of experiment And here too, you get all of this, uh, rich auto completion. So I'm just about to run out of time, but I just want to show one query. So, um, I want to create here also a user and create a post for that user and give it a title. Hello from data exposed. And uh, this is a single query that will essentially in a transaction, create both a user and a post. And I can run that. And as we'll see, we got this user. I can technically, um, also define which fields I want to get back. And I think the real power here is to show, um, how relations, uh, how easy it is to fetch relations. And so here I'm creating another user, but this time also returning the posts. And as you can see, we have it. And so I'm already going over time. So I'll pause there. And, um, yeah, that was the Prisma. If you want to check it out, just go to prisma.io. And if you want to check out the Prisma data platform, you can do that at, uh, cloud.prisma.io. Awesome. Thanks so much, Daniel. It was really cool to see all that. And we'll link uh, to prisma.io from the blog. And I think you and Davide are working on a cool blog. So hopefully we'll have something to share in that space yes. soon. Um, thanks so much, Daniel. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Anna. Awesome. Okay. Uh, just a few more things we want to get uh, as we kind of come to the close of our show. Wanted to bring up the Azure SQL Tech Community blogs. There were a lot this month. A lot of things we've already talked about. Just one thing to highlight is Nico is continuing his how-to series for managed instance. Those are in blue. You're going to want to check out all of these, as well as the audit trail blog from Andreas. 
And finally, from the Azure database support team, they release some really interesting blogs. If any of these topics are related to something you or your organization are facing, I would definitely go check these out. They go pretty deep and they go very prescriptive in helping you find uh, solutions. And without further ado, I'm going to bring up Cheryl and Cheryl and I are going to talk about a few things. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, how are you? I am good and I'm happy to have you on. And today I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, I know there was some new Azure Data Studio kind of migration tools that became available. I was wondering if you could show us like, how does docs play into this? You know, thank you so much. I, I want to just give a quick shout out to Muhammad. He did an excellent job talking about the extension before. And Azure Data Studio, I can tell you, is one of my favorite tools. And if you haven't seen him talk about it, I definitely feel like go back and check it out. You know, before I talk about the content, I want to share a story about data. I think migration is one of the most important relationships that you can have with your data. In fact, it's almost like a regular relationship, right? You have to figure it out. You have to know what works, what doesn't work. You can't ghost it. <laughs> because if you ghost it, it doesn't turn out well. And in fact, bad things can happen. So unlike relationships, which can get complicated, the content team at Microsoft has put together an excellent tutorial that gives us the walkthrough of this extension. Now, the tutorials, I love them because to me, they're like a roadmap to success. And because we're literally doing SQL in a minute, I won't have a lot of time to go through the tutorial, but I want to point out one of the most important features of all of the tutorials that we write. And if we take a look at it, the most important feature is the prereq. Now, oftentimes we don't pay attention to this area. In fact, sometimes we go right past it. But the prereq is really important in making sure that you have a successful experience with your migration. So I highly recommend as you go through this content to go through the prereq, even if you think your environment is okay, go through the prereq, make sure that you have everything installed. One of the things that we do in the content team is that we often address feedback issues or comments regarding why this doesn't work or I'm not having a good experience. More often than not, that relates to something may have been missed in going through this checklist. We put these here to help you be successful. So I definitely recommend going through that. The other area that I think is very important is a lot of the recommendations that we have. So as we go through, you see those colored blocks that are throughout all the tutorials. It's really important to look at those. We can't cover every scenario, so we love the feedback from our community if there's something that we didn't consider that's impacting your experience. But those areas are very important to ensure the success. Another, and as you start to go through, we go, I love this part because it goes through the launch and a lot of individuals think, well, oh, I already know how to do setups and installs. Pay attention to this area because there are selections that you need to make in order to make sure that your migration is successful. A miss here or even a miss in the prereq could impact your migration and create a lot of frustration, almost like a frustrating relationship, but this is easier to figure out. We actually released four different tutorials for you. Now, some of the tutorials are similar depending on your environment. This one that we're reviewing right now is for Azure SQL VM. We also released a tutorial for SQL Managed Instance. So once you determine which one that you need, I would walk through the tutorial and go through all of the steps to make sure that your migration will be successful. I love that the migration gives us steps. We have checkpoints, as you can see from the screen. There are different definitely different step segments that you can go through. So if you have to stop and come back, the way our content is designed, you can go right back to where you left off. So that's a great aspect of this as well. Again, this is a new feature for Azure Data Studio. It's an extension and we'll be coming out with new extensions. So continue to check back with us and see how we're doing with that. Anna, that's about all I have. Back to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Cheryl, uh, for coming on the show and be sure to check that out. Um, just as we're wrapping up, I do want to let everyone know um, that we if you're streaming in from Learn TV, uh, we are about to get kicked off Learn TV. Uh, so I just want to let you know we have a few more exciting things to show you. Uh, if you want to hop over to our YouTube channel, you can hear the rest of them. Uh, 
if you want to stay up to date with what the docs are doing, you want to get involved, uh, go ahead and check out some of these references. You can even email the team if you have feedback. You can follow them on Twitter or reference the contributor guide if you see changes that you want to make. Uh, next, uh, we are going to bring up Marisa, the co-producer for this show, uh, to talk to us about some upcoming events. Hi, Marisa. Hi, Anna. Thanks so much for having me on. I just yeah, of course. Go Thanks. Yeah. So I want to quickly go through what's going on this month. Um, as always, there are a ton of events we speak at, and I just want to highlight a few of them. On 1021, there's a fun game show type thing um, about Azure Arc and its MVPs versus a couple of our, our product group members here. And so they're going to hopefully uh, compete for the Azure Cup. Uh, we'll see who wins there. Uh, on 1021, we have Cloud Day 2021, and, and Davide will be speaking there. On 1026, there's actually a fun Azure Arc Oktoberfest themed webinar uh, where Jess Schultz will be on along with some other Dell speakers. And on 1028, there is a all day DevOps 2021 conference and Julie will be speaking there. Um, in addition, we have our Data Exposed live show going on this month. On 1013, we have a Azure Data Factory Power Hour. So lots of great demos there, make sure to tune in. And on 1027, we'll continue the Azure VM series and uh, have our episode five there. All links to these events will be on our, in that blog that Anna's posted about or told, told you about already. So make sure to check them out and register there. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marisa. It's always cool to see how involved our team is in various events. Um, just a few things that I do every month that I wanted to wrap with you all. Uh, our Learn module of the month is Architect Full Stack Apps and Automate Deployments with GitHub. This goes into using GitHub Actions for Azure SQL Database, uh, Azure Static Web Apps, Azure Functions, and Azure Logic Apps. It's a fun one. Again, you can get free hands-on resources with Azure SQL with guided tutorials. Uh, definitely want to check this out. Uh, my pick of the month is a shameless plug for a new module on Microsoft Learn we just released called Deploying IoT Solutions with Azure SQL Database. Again, it's a really great a uh, great module because it has this template that you can use to learn for free, but you can also modify the template to apply to any of your IoT scenarios that you might be considering. Um, all that being said, I want to thank you all for tuning in. You might have said, hey, I saw a lot on this show and I'm not sure how to keep up with everything uh, Anna and the team said. Uh, then you can head over to aka.ms slash news update uh, everything you saw today is represented in blog form with links to more references so you can go as deep as you need to go. And again, I just want to thank you all for tuning in and we hope to see you next time on Data Exposed.